Representative Bonamici and I have introduced the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act to finally end the importation of asbestos and use of asbestos in manufacturing products. The senator was the driving force behind this sweeping chemical safety law reform. Allen's loss represents the hundreds of thousands of lives lost to asbestos-related disease. The Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Act is one of the key pieces of legislation that the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network is moving this Congress, and I fully hope and expect that this bill is going to be passed in the House, passed in the Senate, and it will become law this Congress. When you hear the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act, it is not for one man, Allen Reinstein. It's for the hundreds of thousands. It's long past time to end this public health threat. Welcome to a very special episode of Outside Council. Today, I have the honor of sitting down with Linda Reinstein, a beacon of resilience and advocacy in the fight against asbestos disease, which continues to claim an estimated 40,000 American lives every year. Linda's journey began in 2003, when her beloved husband, Alan, fell ill and was diagnosed with malignant pleural mesothelioma. Devastated by the impact of asbestos disease, Linda channeled her grief into action and co-founded the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization in 2004, turning her personal tragedy into a triumph for others. Linda's determination only grew stronger. For nearly two decades, she has been at the forefront of lobbying efforts and community initiatives to raise awareness and prevent asbestos-related diseases. And just last week, a milestone was reached in the fight against asbestos as the Environmental Protection Agency finally banned the predominant form of asbestos still in use, chrysotile. Join us as we delve into Linda's remarkable journey, her incredible advocacy efforts, and her ongoing battle for justice and the protection of public health. Linda, welcome to Outside Council, and thank you for joining us. I am excited to be here, Jeffrey. I've known you for such a long time, and I am really, uh, I applaud you for your book. It is an important book for people to read and to understand. Well, I thank you and applaud you for your tremendous public service, which is what I want to ask you about. Tell us, please, a bit about yourself and the work you do. Sure. So for 20 years, I've been beating my head on sharp corners. I've actually co-founded ADIO, the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization, with my dear colleague, Doug Larkin. When Doug and I co-founded the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization, we started really not having a total mission and vision clear in our minds. We met in Washington and we started from pain. What we realized is asbestos victims didn't have a voice. They couldn't come to the stakeholder table. And little by little, we began to realize more about the truce, the history, the crimes that went on. We founded ADIO on the premise that education and advocacy and community was really important. Little did we know we were going to walk into the trust fund tort reform shenanigans in Washington in 2004. It was a quick learning curve on what happens in Washington and how little the asbestos victim's voice really matters. And so you mentioned that you founded this organization, you and your co-founder, 20 years ago, both of you coming from a place of pain. Will you tell us about that? When you get a mesothelioma diagnosis, you have most likely had been suffering from symptoms for as much as a year before because the symptoms mirror so many other things like difficulty in breathing, pleural effusion. So it takes a while to be finally diagnosed. And I think when somebody is diagnosed with mesothelioma, like my husband, I had to learn very quickly. I had never heard of mesothelioma. I couldn't pronounce it. Uh, and then soon learned that it was an aggressive terminal cancer. And my learning curve was 24 hours. Obviously, when I describe it to students, I kind of use the analogy of a blister, that there is fluid in between the lining of the lung and the lung itself. And that's when the surgeon came out. And with my dark humor, I said, he said, I think Alan might have mesothelioma. And I'm feeling really ignorant, Jeffrey. Like, I'd never heard of this. We're urban, we're educated. And I said, I don't understand. He said, well, he starts to speak. I said, can you write it down? He gets my tear-soaked tissue out. And I said, it's a kind of cancer you can cure, right? And he said, I can treat it. 
at that time, I didn't even think about curative and treatment. Those words didn't even go in the same sentence. So that was the learning curve for us. And Alan had no clue. His doctor, only when he had gone in for a routine exam because he had some shortness of breath, the doctor asked, have you ever been exposed to asbestos? And my husband wore a suit and tie, was a brilliant business person. He said, no, I don't think so. They had the doctor asked, did you ever work in a shipyard? Did you do home repairs? Questions could have been answered. So, so just to wind this back, if, if we could. So, you know, a, a bit over 20 years ago, you and your husband were living on the West Coast. Alan and I lived this idyllic life in Manhattan Beach. We were involved with the temple, the school, the community. What could be better than the life that we shared with our then 10-year-old daughter? It was perfect, or so I thought. And that's how Alan's early warning symptoms led to a diagnosis that changed our lives forever. He began having shortness of breath. He went to the doctor. The doctor said, you have fluid pressing down on the outside of your lung, which we would call a pleural effusion. And as part of his treatment process, they tried to inject a talc-based product to dry up the weeping fluid, but it resulted ultimately through, I'm sure, a biopsy of a diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma, which neither of you have ever heard of. Absolutely. After Alan went through recovery and the surgeon was asking me directly, was Alan exposed to asbestos? So this is now the surgeon, not the general practitioner. And I said, I don't know. You'll have to ask Alan. He said, I only see mesothelioma when someone's been exposed to asbestos. And at that time, Jeffrey, I'm still thinking, you don't really think about your air water and soil free of contaminants. I just trusted the government to take care of that. And I was wrong. And so the challenge, of course, for Alan, like so many people who were diagnosed with mesothelioma is people develop this asbestos related cancer, the, the cancer that really doesn't occur in the absence of asbestos exposure. And yet asbestos is simply a microscopic fiber from a rock that was used in many different types of products that people, especially of a certain era, breathed, never knowing they were breathing it. When Alan was diagnosed, that was right after the talking, I came home and put mesothelioma, of course, into the computer. And Alan's at the hospital. Emily, my sweet daughter, is just 10. And I'm searching and I'm reading for the first time about this aggressive cancer. Then the more I read, it's six to 12 months life expectancy. And as I'm reading the cause, because I was a science major in college, I'm reading everything points to asbestos. And I'm thinking it was banned. I know it was banned. And in that 24 hours, I felt gobsmacked. I had to go back to the hospital and Alan looked at my face. He said, uh, Linda, what's wrong? I said, Nothing. Dr. Fuller thinks you might have a kind of cancer, but don't worry. He's going to work on a treatment plan for you and you'll be home soon. I had no clue what that treatment plan looked like. And, and I think you probably know from the work you've done, Jeffrey, the patient has to have two votes when it comes to the treatment plan. What is the right plan medically and what's the right plan for the patient? Because the procedures are so radical for treatment. Alan wanted the cancer gone and out. So we had six second opinions in about uh, 10 days. And I made a spreadsheet, because that's how I think, of which treatment, which doctor looked best. And we went through it. And Alan wanted the radical EPP surgery, which was done in 2004. And I know some of the surgical techniques have changed since then. But he wanted it out. He wanted it all out. We used to ski black diamonds, run marathons, sail. Like asbestos was not even in our vocabulary. He opted to have, as you described, EPP, which stands for extra pleural pneumonectomy and is a very invasive surgery where they take out the lung, the lung lining, the sac around the heart and areas of the diaphragm, and they rebuild with mesh some of those things to keep your heart inside your chest, to keep your internal organs that were suppressed by the diaphragm in place. It's a very difficult recovery. I mean, they actually remove a rib to get the left lung out 
and then do the other things that you're speaking about, strip off the pericardium and surgically re replace his diaphragm mm -hmm. for more time. And of course, they resected his lung. We called it the shark bite. Living in Los Angeles, that seemed to fit our waters. Mm -hmm. And he was cut, obviously, from the mediastinum to the middle of his back. So recovery was huge. Alan was terrified that now that he was missing a lung, that his breathing would be so compromised, Jeffrey. And I had, I had to try to use like our scuba diving experience, like just trust your gear. You're going to be okay. I mean, there was a lot of that stuff that went on. And Alan did best with a big bundle of keys. This was before all the key cards and stuff, you know, as a, as an executive going to the office was important. Getting to his desk and managing, you know, a highly productive staff was, was great. And all of a sudden he was rendered sick with a disease that most people, when they heard it was kind of like, oh my gosh, to be honest, I, I hope one day I can develop some actual grant about the psychological impact of asbestos to the patient and the family, because about four months later, Alan wanted to commit suicide. But but it all makes sense. You know these stories, like like Barbara in your book. You know these stories. So um, through your organization, you provide uh, information and resources that you and Alan didn't have 20 years ago when he was struck with mesothelioma. Oh, you're you're so right. When Alan was first sick, I'd go to the garage and turn the light off and sit on a cardboard box and I'd cry. Is how how do you deal with a catastrophic surgery, cancer diagnosis? He never went back to work again. I wasn't thinking about me. I was just thinking about Alan and our family. And and I'd dry my eyes. I'd try to come in and now and say, Linda, what's wrong? Your eyes are red. Oh, must be that allergy. So I think you have to have multiple personalities when you're the caregiver of somebody with mesothelioma because it is a very tough fight. So having a community, some people that understand we're Jewish and our rabbi was phenomenal. Our community was great. And you have to have a village around you or I think survival is really difficult. Knowing that asbestos is ubiquitous, nearly invisible, the latency period is 10 to 50 years. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. In other words, if you find it, you don't want it, right? You can't get rid of it, whether it's in your home or in your body. It is not something that you want to get hit with a, a diagnosis or finding it where you need abatement. So learning the tools and the techniques, I was angry. Frankly, I was pissed off. Like we're honest people. Alan was like the most honest business person you could ever want to shake hands with. So in my mind, it's like, how did this happen to us? We're like a good family. Do you remember that book when bad things happen to good people? It was written by sure. the rabbi. Well, my rabbi wanted to bring it over. I said, I'm not interested. I don't even, you know, it challenges your your social and your cultural being because you're angry. Jeffrey, you and a, as a trial lawyer, you probably got hot and angry in a courtroom, I imagine. I was angry as a mother and a wife and thought if I didn't do something, it would eat me up alive. And that's really the genesis behind starting ADAO. I mean, Alan got diagnosed. It was the day after Father's Day in 2003. And when he started to feel better and I got him to, you know, a care group, so his mental state was stronger. That's when I started reading more and more, realizing this man-made problem had gone on for a hundred years. I guess I get a PhD in, in hard luck, but I've learned, I've done research, I write papers. I think it's really important to to have that knowledge, not only for medical treatment, for the path forward. And I think for me, that's why, I mean, your book was so important is because if you, if we don't fight for our right in a courtroom with civil litigation, we lose the opportunity to hold corporations accountable and to get evidence that may help the next person. And I think, or help someone in Washington, which is where I spend a lot of my time. ADAO is today one of the most influential most respected advocacy programs for the banning of asbestos and the protection of people from future exposures to asbestos, not just in America, but all over the world. Two weeks ago, the Environmental Protection Agency made <laughs> a major announcement regarding the continued use of asbestos. Can you tell us about that, please? I'm going to tell you at 35,000 feet, then I'm going to land the plane and tell you the rest. So it took eight years. We worked on passing the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act, which was to reform TSCA. Uh, it was a 1976 year old law and it was outdated, so outdated. And you know this, the EPA couldn't even ban asbestos. 
So uh, we worked many years and it was signed into law by President Obama. And Emily and I were invited there to the White House. And President Obama started speaking. And I said, Emily, he's going to say, he's going to speak about asbestos. She said, oh, mom, you're crazy. You're just always thinking about asbestos. And all of a sudden he says. The Toxic Substance Control Act was signed by President Ford. But even with the best of intentions, uh, the law didn't quite work the way it should have in practice. The system was so complex, it was so burdensome, that our country hasn't even been able to uphold a ban on asbestos. Well, here's the good news. Uh, that's exactly why we're here today. Uh, the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for the 21st century will make it easier for the EPA to review chemicals already on the market, as well as the new chemicals our scientists and our businesses design. It will do away with an outdated bureaucratic formula to evaluate safety and instead focus solely on the risks to our health. And it will finally grant our scientists and our public servants at the EPA the funding they need to get the job done and keep us safe. It means that somewhere out there on the horizon we can make uh, our politics like less toxic as well. So, uh, so this is a good day. And with that, I think it's time to sign the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act into Law. Let's do it. We just heard like remarkable words. Now this is 2016, so Alan's been gone for 10 years by then. So um, it took us eight years to implement the bill, the Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act. Asbestos had to be prioritized. Then they have to go through risk evaluation, then risk management, then a rule. And I don't work on K Street, so everything I do is just hard and time-consuming. There's no whining, no crying in baseball, but it's not easy. We, I fight the richest of the rich. So at the end, what we have, and it's, it is great news. In fact, you were one of the first people that texted me, so hats off to you. What we have now is a part one chrysotyl asbestos ban in six conditions of use. What it did do was raise awareness around the world. It also forced the EPA and the White House to say what you've known, that all forms of asbestos are carcinogen. Um, the fact that it only regulates one fiber is a problem, but it is going to stop the imports for the leading industry, the chloralkali industry. So those will end on, I believe it's May 28th, unless it's legally challenged. So there's it's a win for awareness. It's a win for imports. The transition period is long, but I guess... Probably, and you would know this best when you're negotiating, if it feels like a win to both sides, then obviously you've done okay. And I got messages literally from around the world. We're, we're not done. We're not done. I didn't know until that morning if Senator Merkley and Representative Bonamici would walk away from the Alan Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act. Would they see part one is done? And I'm like, oh, please don't think it's done. And sure enough, they stood up straight and we have more to do. We'll fight harder. And we want a comprehensive bill that bans all fibers in all uses and where the industry can't go to the Fifth Circuit Court and have it overturned. If it's a legislative fix, it's very different right. than EPA trying to regulate. So we need legislation. And we've been working on this now for 20 years. Historically, most of the asbestos that was deliberately imported and incorporated into products was a particular form of asbestos called chrysotile. And depending upon what statistics you read, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of all asbestos containing products in the United States that were used contained chrysotile, right? Yes, but I would probably put a year on it, but you're the expert. I would say in the last 20 years, only chrysotile because there's cross-contamination. Okay. And the incredible news that you helped make happen, you and your colleagues at ADAO uh, and other advocates, was that the EPA announced that it was banning the importation and continued use over time of chrysotile asbestos in a number of different ways. Now, you and I know this is not the first time the EPA has announced a ban on chrysotile asbestos, is it? It is not, Counselor. <laughs> in fact, in 1989, the EPA did that. And then what happened? 
you know, I just want to slap them with a wet trout. They did, <laughs> they did 10 years of work, had reams of paper, tons of research. It's the EPA for Pete's sake. They ban it. And then industry comes in with their monogram briefcases and they want to overturn it based on cost burden analysis. And average person's like, what's that mean? They used a loophole in Tosca, which is what we tried to reform with Obama signing the Lautenberg bill into law. But the industry looks for loopholes. They look for it in Congress. They look for it in a courtroom and they look for it in their corporations. I found it so interesting in all my research early on, the lobbyists that used to work for the tobacco company, once they had those decisive news laws and regulations in the late 70s, those lobbyists went to work for the asbestos industry. I mean, it's just the playbook. I'll raise a little doubt. I'll hide the information. I'll put out some misinformation just in case. And we will spin this with propaganda. And if you have enough doubt, it works. Linda, how many Americans were needlessly exposed to chrysotile asbestos, would you think, between the early 90s and now because the EPA couldn't successfully ban chrysotile asbestos and survive legal challenge? Hundreds of thousands of Americans died between 1989 and present day. We estimate 40,000 Americans every year from a preventable asbestos-caused disease. Not every person diagnosed with an asbestos-caused disease is actually diagnosed or their death certificate reflects that disease. So we used to say 40% more people die and they're not even accounted for. The database I use is for occupational exposure. So when we think about take home or the deadly hug, how many more people don't have death certificates that are coded correctly? I mean, case in point, it was the morning of Alan's funeral, you know, Jews bury in two days. And I remember that rabbi calling me and said, we have a little problem, Linda. My rabbi never has a little problem. He's like, I, we just get it done. And he said that the coroner won't sign off on Alan's death certificate without an autopsy. Now, the, the funeral's in like four hours. And I said, I asked the oncologist, everything was done. And he said they had enough pathology. And he said, they want occupational exposure. They have to have an autopsy. He said, the two choices are to send Alan back to the morgue for an autopsy. I mean, this is the day of his funeral for an autopsy or to bury Alan and not have anyone do the mitzvah and put soil on top of his coffin. And then they would exhume him and take him. I said, no, I'm not doing that. Give me plan C. So we had a coroner come to the mortuary and I, I gave them the information they needed about occupational exposure and they signed a death certificate. How wow. many people go through that hours before they have to put their loved one to rest? If I didn't understand how important statistics are, I would have said, fine, it just cause of death, you know, respiratory failure. So, but no, it's listed as mesothelioma. I did it and we buried him and we buried him the right way. He had a proper Jewish funeral. Linda, did I understand you to say that approximately a million Americans have died of asbestos diseases from the first time EPA announced a ban on asbestos, which was then overturned a few years later? Yes, Jeffrey, you're absolutely right. Over a million Americans needlessly died from the time EPA tried to ban asbestos to today. And every one of those asbestos diseases is preventable, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's what produces the anger and the rage. There's Emily, she was uh, bat mitzvahed in January of 2006. Alan was so proud. We're so proud of her reading from the Torah. He was very sick then. Alan loved the rain. We left on Monday our home. Alan had, had swallowed something incorrectly, and they thought he might have aspiration pneumonia. So we we're going out to see Alan. He was a very different Alan. Dying with dignity was something Alan was really uncomfortable with because he felt like he had lost all dignity and freedom. But we were going out on Monday and it was rainy. And we get there and Alan has a demand mask on, very different than his cannula and supplemental oxygen. And we know that Alan is very sick. However, the doctors are still saying Alan had more tread on his tires. And Emily's on one side, me on the other. And Emily says, Dad, you're a champ. You won. 
you never gave up. And Alan's heart monitor flatlined. Oh. And it was during Grey's Anatomy and no one moved. I'm thinking, don't you bring in a crash cart? You know, we're, we're looking, I'm, I'm still like shocked and no one moved. And I thought, Alan has died. And that's, that's how I learned about the death. And we left a few hours later with a plastic bag that said personal belongings. There was no arm around my shoulder or Emily's. The sun had come out. It had stopped raining. And I take that as a sign from heaven that Alan was telling me and us that we would be okay. But we started a new journey with no help. And, you know, I started ADO in 2004 and Alan died in 2006. Jeffrey, I was clueless. How do, how, I, I didn't even know how to, how do you go from being a wife to a widow to a single mom with grief? There was no book like what to expect when you're expecting. I didn't have that playbook. And that's what I think for me, ADO became really important for people to be able to share their story, have their story be heard by others. Let their lawmakers hear their story. Never use in a bad way, but let people use their story because we can write all the academic papers we want, Jeffrey. It doesn't matter. The statistics are great in a courtroom, probably better for you than me, but we want people's stories to be heard, felt, shared, and remembered. And that's really how I cut my teeth on digital storytelling. And one of the many uh, resources or services that your organization provides is, is you create introductions uh, for people who have mesothelioma or their family members to their lawmakers with whom they're constituents. You make those introductions so that they can go tell the senator or the congressperson, this is happening to me and I'm in your district. And I want you to ban asbestos. And I want you to provide more resources for the families that are struck by it. So having those stories allows me to strategically play 3D chess and have those meetings with the lawmakers in person. And let me tell you, they don't forget. They don't forget. Storytelling in person in Congress is hugely beneficial. People want to be heard. Whether you win or you lose, you want your story to be heard and you want the facts to be known. If Donald Trump defeats Joe Biden in November. Ugh. In New York City, we have a lot of asbestos buildings and there's a whole debate about asbestos. I mean, a lot of people could say that if the World Trade Center had asbestos, it wouldn't have burned down, it wouldn't have melted, okay? A lot of people think asbestos, a lot of people in my industry think asbestos is the greatest fireproofing material ever, ever made. And I can tell you that I've seen tests of asbestos versus the the new material that's being used, and it's not even a con, it's like a heavyweight champion against a lightweight from high school. Couldn't he, as president, appoint a new EPA director with instructions to repeal the asbestos ban? Well, you'd have to have merits. You'd have to have legal merits to, to appeal it, because it's not an executive order. It was a law and then a regulation, promulgating a regulation. But yes, but you don't even have to undo the regulation. And you know this as a lawyer, you can go in and just make implementation of the law, compliance of the law, just kind of faulty. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can undermine a law without repealing it. There can be a lot of damage depending on who is elected in the next election that would impact the asbestos rule. Would a federal law banning asbestos that is then signed by President Biden be more durable than an EPA ban? Absolutely. So that's what we've been saying for eight years, eight years since we had the Lautenberg bill pass is that we need, we need legislation versus regulation. We need a full comprehensive ban of all fibers and all uses. And we need the courtroom door to be locked to industry. The Fifth Circuit Court I don't even want to hear from those people anymore. They need to close their doors and go for lunch. We're done. So we need a hard and fast a legislation that's signed into law, and we don't have a lot of time. We want the justices on the Supreme Court to be balanced and understand the, the Constitution. We don't want to fight battles that we fought before, whether it's in EPA or in the Supreme Court. I mean, there has to be case law that, that stands up to policy and politics because we're seeing the unwinding of America. And if we ever lose our Seventh Amendment right, 
it is going to be really hard because that is how we hold companies accountable. There are forms of asbestos that are natural geological contaminants of some talc-based products. What do you say to those, including some of my colleagues who are plaintiff's lawyers, who represent people suffering from mesothelioma, who argue that your efforts don't go far enough because they don't affirmatively work to ban those talc products too? Well, that has been a problem for the last four years. I can't lie. Um, talc litigation um, is, is really important, but also the definitions and the testing methodology has also been important. So uh, we're coming out of the stone age on that. So what do I tell the plaintiff's lawyers about definitions and testing? I say, look at what has standing. So if we look at the asbestos definition that the EPA used for part one, it is the same one that we have in the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act. So now we have part one that's only one fiber and six conditions of use with the same definition. So we have to look at what do we want to get done? What can we get done? And what can we get done without causing problems to any other statutory laws and agencies? And I think that's where you have to come up with a working solution. And everyone needs to talk. You're very good, Jeffrey. You're very good. I'm sure you're a good arbitrator and, and mediator when it comes to those conversations to have both sides come to the table. But we have to do that. We are not going to get everything lawyers want in the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act. And they got a lot less in part one. I'm really worried about the fact that EPA says asbestos is so dangerous, that's why we're banning it. But they didn't ban the amphiboles. They didn't ban them. They say the only one in use is chrysotile. But it would be intuitively, I think, for a juror to hear if they didn't ban it, then there must not be a risk. The issue boiled down is that asbestos in its commercial forms is well defined in regulatory law. Asbestos in its non-commercial forms is not as well defined. And while you want to ban commercial forms of asbestos, you don't want it to seem as though the government is hinting that the non-commercial forms are safe just because they weren't included in the ban. And the problem that you are facing is you are trying to do this public health work, but you don't want to harm people who develop mesothelioma from talc exposure because they're exposed to the non-commercial forms of asbestos. And walking that line has been very difficult. Yes, but they also need to look at the bill because I actually made a specific change for one successful talc lawyer. He said, Linda, put the word commercial in the title, in the bill, that will do it. And I did. And that didn't do it. So we have to have an understanding of what can be done with language. Now, we don't have commercial really in the part one. It's not going to do justice for a, a, a tout case. And I think it's very important, anybody watching this, is there are jurisdictional differences. EPA has jurisdiction over chemicals and FDA has jurisdiction over personal care and cosmetics. So what we do with EPA does not impact talc. It could if you tried to you know, rework a definition, but what we're doing with the Allen Reinstein bill doesn't carry over. We're using the same definition that EPA used in AHERA, in part one, part two, asbestos reporting rule, OSHA has. I mean, we have to use the, that language until the government can do more and maybe NIOSH can get their game on. We, we can't be that outlier. We can't deliver that. Well, I understand what you're saying, and I will proudly advocate on this podcast and as I did in my book for the banning of asbestos, period, stop, and that you are an unapologetic, incredibly effective, very personally affected advocate for victims of mesothelioma and asbestos diseases, and that your efforts to ban asbestos are all with the very best intentions and never indifferent to the plight of any victim of mesothelioma, whether it's from talc-based exposure or commercial asbestos exposure. And that's true. And I appreciate that. As someone who has an enormous amount of experience, not just from your own personal circumstances with Alan, but having spent the next 20 years trying to help 
people and families, you know, who are suffering from mesothelioma, its intersection with the civil justice system and whether people who are struck by the disease should enter it is something you've had to give a lot of thought to. And I was wondering if you would share some of your insights. Thank you for that question, because I, I want more asbestos victims and their families to understand that seeking civil justice is not a crime. That if we have been harmed, hurt, suffered, or have died, that is a constitutional right to, to use our Seventh Amendment and to seek civil justice. Obviously, you're a lawyer, you know, on the grounds of the case. But I was thinking, why do people hesitate? And then I went back to the Reinstein table and I thought, first, we were so focused on medical treatment for Alan, we couldn't even think about legal. But that's where I found some of the information for treatment was on lawyer websites. So I think teaching people that civil litigation has brought about corporate responsibility, transparency, reduction in imports. They they will, if they're found guilty, there's a financial aspect, but it goes beyond that. And I think for, for the average patient, one, they don't have time. Two, there's a stigma with litigation. They see an 11 o'clock commercial and they just don't want that. Um, some don't understand that the cases are taken on by contingency. So we have that. Um, also, some families... The patient may want to, and the spouse may not want to, that that giving up your privacy comes with this case, those public court filings. And I think lastly, probably the distrust of the legal system. Although Alan and others, when the case is filed, everyone knows that their case is legitimate and they should get a plaintiff's verdict. They don't always get that verdict. The defense is so good with their science for sale and manipulation and jury selection and everything else that there are times I think you might not get a fair trial. But if you don't fight for what is right, how can you win? So I'd like to empower asbestos patients and families to think about civil litigation as an opportunity that the Bill of Rights does afford them, that seeking legal counsel does not mean that there's something wrong with them um, and that it is a course of action that can have merit for their case, but also future cases because we learn from those corporations when they have to divulge um, information and documents. Amen. Beautifully said. And your insights do raise an issue that I'll go ahead and clarify, which is neither you nor your organization send my firm business. Our relationship is based entirely on um, my enormous regard and appreciation of the work you do and chances that we've had together to advocate for victims of asbestos disease, but not through litigation itself. Absolutely. ADO does, does not make medical or legal referrals. That is how we have structured our organization. So we're an independent nonprofit that's able to testify in Congress and to work with agencies um, and, and move policy. And that means there's there's no compromise or anything for sale with ADAO. We do what's right and we have to keep plaintiff litigation out of our work as far as referrals. It's not what we've ever done. How can people who want to join your organization or access some of its resources do so? Well, I love that question. So one is I want everybody when they hear asbestos to think prevention. And where are you going to get the best information? From our website, adao.us. That's the short URL. And we also built a website that says no asbestos, K-N-O-W. I aggregated all the government information. So if you're a homeowner, you're a worker, you're a business person, you can go there. You don't have to go to OSHA, CDC, et cetera, and EPA. It's all there. So that's no asbestos. Get our newsletter, connect and share. If you've been harmed by asbestos or if you have a client that has been harmed and they're ready to tell their story, I want to hear their story. I want to share their story. And, you know, donations help us to do our work. We're 20 years into this. We're lean and mean and we're not done. But every nonprofit has to have donations to feel the work we do and just be authentic and, and support us. Call your members of Congress. It is, if we don't hold members of Congress accountable, it's the same thing in a court with judges. We have a responsibility. And I know that collective activism does work. And um, I know that lawyers, I have the greatest respect for lawyers in the sense of what you accomplish in a courtroom 
and outside of a courtroom. And we have to hold those companies accountable. If it wasn't for Clarence Burrell's case uh, in 73 with that verdict, and he was deceased at that time, corporations never would have started to wean themselves off asbestos. But you can actually see the graphs. 1973, it went on a downhill slope. No one wanted to import asbestos after that. So what, what happens in a courtroom does matter to public health. I wrote to oh. President Bush when Alan was sick in 2003, and it, I'm sure it wasn't very well written and had typos, but I asked him to uh, issue a proclamation for Asbestos Awareness Day. I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of these days that this could help. And they wrote me back, they're concerned about obesity and heart disease. Then I wrote again in 04, and I got the same kind of letter back. And then in 05, leader Harry Reid was a magnificent oh. member of Congress. His office called and said they would support and champion the Asbestos Awareness Day resolution if I wrote it. And I said, I don't know how to write a resolution. If you tell me what I do, I, I can. They said, we will send you a lactation resolution for breastfeeding. <laughs> so I read it. And I have my pajamas trying to get Emily out the door for school. And I'm like, okay. I looked at it, it was all the facts about why it's it's so positive. And I thought, well, I could do an asbestos awareness day. I just start with whereas, and I give every sorry fact about why asbestos is terrible. That's how I wrote the asbestos awareness day resolution. They asked what day I said, April 1st. She said, oh, maybe you'd like another day. It's April's full day. I said, oh no, I know exactly what that is. I want everyone to know it's no joke that asbestos kills. So we started with the day of April 1st, and three years later, we went to a week, and that's where we are now. We have a week of awareness. 20 years we've done global asbestos, and one year we didn't do a resolution because of COVID. So I've got the 19th resolution introduced by Senator Testers and Senator Daines. It passes by unanimous consent, which means everyone has to vote for it. And if I get anyone in the Senate that might have a just a little inkling to, to not uh, vote for it, I give them a call and I have a share your story call. And we have gotten this through for 18 years. Bravo. Well, I'm hardly surprised that you didn't get much help from the administration of President George W. Bush since he included in his State of the Union address in either 05 or 06, I forget which, he wanted to bring an end to the frivolous asbestos lawsuits. So I believe we know where his bread was buttered on that subject. But it's interesting, after we started ADO in 2004, I actually had my first White House meeting like six weeks later because of Dick Cheney. How about I think because of Halliburton. So you just connect the dots. And you do. God bless you. Thank you for all you do to protect public health, to raise awareness about asbestos and asbestos diseases, for appearing on this show. Uh, Linda, I and our entire staff at Outside Council admire you. We thank you and we salute you. I appreciate that. Don't ever stop believing because the power of the people is phenomenally strong. This episode is not a paid advertisement. Linda Reinstein's appearance is for the sole purpose of raising awareness and fostering discussion, and neither parties have received compensation of any type. The Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization is a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization, and it does not make legal referrals. For more information, please visit www.adao.us. A heartfelt thank you to our extraordinary guest, Linda Reinstein, for sharing invaluable insights into this critical public health crisis. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for this very special edition of the Outside Council podcast. This podcast is produced by Shannon McDees of Revel and Convey and Larry Shivana. The opinions expressed on outside counsel are neither legal nor medical advice. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speakers, guests, experts, and or host. They do not expressly nor necessarily reflect the opinion of any institution with which I am or ever have been a member and should never be attributed as such. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Outside Council. I'm Jeffrey B. Simon.